What up, nerds? Welcome back to Earth and Environmental Science. We're going to be doing today meteorology. Okay, so last time we did um, <clears throat> atmosphere and atmosphere systems, and so now we're going to be staying within that unit, uh, but moving from you know basic atmosphere terminology into uh, the specifics of weather and meteorology. Okay, so let's go ahead and get started. All right, so move myself down. All right, so some causes of weather. So, what, so let's get some definitions off the bat. So meteorology itself, this is the study of atmospheric phenomena, such as fog, clouds, snow, rain, lightning. This is lighting, but it's lightning. Okay, essentially the study of weather is what meteorology is, and what weather actually is, is the condition of the atmosphere at a specific place at a specific time. Okay, so the weather outside right now of my window is um, overcast, rainy, and windy. But uh, when you watch this, if you look outside, it might be sunny, it might be clear, it might be snowing, depending on when you watch this. So who knows? But that is what weather is. Now, this is very different from climate. Okay, climate is the long term. Okay, you can see right here, long-term weather for a particular area. Usually it's averaged over 30 or more years. Okay, so we look at climate data as all of the specific weather data for a specific area over a very long period of time. Okay, this way we can uh, analyze patterns. So climate is much more about the patterns and the trends of weather data, whereas just weather is the, at this time, in this place, what does it look like outside? Okay, so this is a little bit different. So as an example, the climate is hot and humid in Miami, but in the picture on the right, it's snowing. Okay, it doesn't mean that the climate does not mean that the weather cannot be one thing or another, and the weather being one thing or another does not mean that the climate has to adhere to that weather. Okay, they are two different things, but they are related. Okay, so weather and meteorology, uh, a lot of it has to do with air masses, how the air uh, on Earth and on Earth's atmosphere moves around and how these masses kind of interact with one another, okay? So an air mass is a large body of air, takes on the characteristics of the area over which it forms. So you've got the land down here, the air mass floating above it, and it is going to uh, take on a lot of the characteristics of the land underneath, okay? Now, some um, uh, descriptions and some things that you're going to want to be aware of, okay, uh, as well as their abbreviations. So C means continental, okay? This is a, an air mass that is forming over a continent over land. M means maritime or marine, meaning that it is over the ocean. Okay, so and the description of these is dry versus wet, and the only reason that we say that is because over the ocean, obviously, you're going to be getting a lot more water vapor. Over a continent, over land, you're going to get a lot less. So if you look over here on this little uh, map as an example, okay, you can see all of the ones that are over land, this one right here, this one right here, these are both sea, they're continental, whereas these over the ocean are maritime. Okay, and then there are four other uh, descriptors based on where in relation to Earth's uh, latitudes these air masses are. Okay, are they closer to the poles, are they closer to the equator, or somewhere in between? Okay, so as an example, uh, E is equatorial, it's right at the equator, it's usually very warm. T is tropical, all right, that's just uh, above or just below the equator. Okay, it's very, it's nearby. Okay, polar. It's very cold. That is close to the poles, but not quite at the poles. And then uh, A is Arctic and or Antarctic, and that it means that it's actually fully at the poles, all the way uh, at the edge of the Earth. These are very, very cold. So you can see these here again. So when you combine them together, it's just a good way to describe what we're seeing. So a continental Arctic air mass is going to be very cold and forming over land. Whereas a maritime tropical land mass is going to be relatively warm and forming over the ocean. Okay? And then right here you can actually see a little continental tropical air mass as well. Okay? Okay. So wind. This should be a little bit of a review from our last unit or our last um, section. What wind is is the movement of air caused by differences in air pressure. Okay? 
greater the difference, faster the wind. So if I've got really high pressure over here versus low pressure over here, in between as they move past, uh, move from one to the other, it's going to go. Whoosh, it's going to go very quickly as it shifts as that pressure difference uh, kind of equalizes and, and equals out. Okay. So as we talk about wind, we need to talk about the global wind systems because remember this is. Earth science. We're talking about the entire Earth and how all of its systems work. So let's talk about global wind systems. So a couple things you should be aware of. There are pressure belts uh, all around the Earth. Okay. So this uh, this is going to be the same thing that we've talked about before over and over and over again. It comes back to, once again, convection currents. As something warms up here, it rises. And then as it rises, it starts to cool. And the cool air becomes le uh, more dense. And so it then falls and then it warms up again, becomes less dense, and rises again, and you get that circular convection current. And you can see that here as well. Okay, Air closer to uh, the surface of the Earth warms up, rises, and then slowly cools and sinks back down until it rises again. Okay, So this forms these pressure belts. All right? So as warm air rises at the equator, and moves towards the poles, it cools down. As it cools, some of the air sinks right here around the 30 degrees north and south lines, here and here, okay? So as it sinks, the air particles are gonna be pushing down on the surface of the Earth, okay? That's where that pressure comes in. So as it comes in, it goes and pushes down into the Earth. So you're getting a higher pressure system in that area. Now this isn't like, super high pressure you can't like physically feel it on your body it's not like somebody's pushing on your chest but you do feel it in certain ways it does put pressure on your body okay and then at the poles once the wind goes all the way over okay so because it sinks down here a little bit and then as it uh gets towards the pole it starts to cool even more cool air sinks and moves towards the equator so as the uh wind up here as the air up here cools down it's going to be sinking back towards the equator uh, so that it warms up and then comes back. So sometimes you'll get these big, really, really big air mass movements from all the way from the equator all the way to the poles and back. But there are also these uh, kind of sub movements and these are called Hadley cells. So you got one here, one here. Okay, these are Hadley cells, which are smaller convection currents within. Okay. And then this also goes into the uh, rest of the global wind systems. And so we see a pattern because of um, a number of things, because of you know pressure systems, because of these uh, convection currents, and because of the Coriolis effects, which I'm going to go over in the next slide. Okay, but we've got three major ones that we see. We've got the polar easterlies. Now remember, you can break this down. Polar means it's going to be at the poles. Okay, so at the North Pole and the South Pole, and these are the easterlies, meaning they're blowing from the east. And this is where it gets a lot, uh, a little difficult for people. They're not blowing towards the east, they're blowing from the east, okay? The reason they're called easterlies is because they move from east to west, okay? So, and these came up, uh, a lot of these um, terms came up during the times of sailing. So the sailors would be like, you know, like what winds do we need to deal with? We need to deal with the westerlies or the easterlies. These are going to be the winds coming from those directions. Okay, the polar easterlies that blow from east to west between 60 and 90 degrees latitude in both hemispheres. So that's up here and down here. Okay, then you've got the westerlies. At the westerlies, the wind belt, uh, this is found between 30 and 60 degrees latitude in both hemispheres. So this is going in the opposite direction. It's coming from the west, okay? And uh, usually this is, um, is going to be a, a different sort of uh, temperature. So you're going to see difference in pressure and temperature and density as it moves in the opposite direction. And then the trade winds are also blowing from the east. These go uh, northeast from here. Sorry, they blow northeast from there. And then southeast from here. Okay. And these are blowing towards the equator. So from the 30 degrees north or 30 degrees south uh, in, a, in a westerly 
Oh, sorry, in a they're blowing west, which means they are coming from the east. So there's so the trade winds are technically easterlies, and they are blowing this way. Okay. Okay. So another thing with the global wind systems. So the, if you com if you combine the pressure belts with the Coriolis effect, this is where we get our global winds. So the Coriolis effect is a really interesting but kind of difficult to understand concept for a lot of people. Okay. The definition I have here is that it's the deflection of particles to the right in the northern hemisphere and to the left in the southern hemisphere due to the Earth's rotation. So I'm going to use my mouse as an example. Okay. So if this is my mouse and I uh, draw a line straight down the mouse, easy. Nothing goes, nothing goes on. I can draw my line straight down. Everything's fine. However, if this is the Earth, okay, and the Earth spins well as long as i'm on the surface of the earth if i draw that line i'm going to go straight but if i'm just above it if i'm just above the surface of the earth and it's spinning what's going to happen is that as this spins around i'm going to go in a straight line and i'm going to end up back here okay which is going to look like oh boy oops which is going to look like if I were to draw that line again, it was going to look like it's going to go around. It's going to deflect off to one side because of the spin of that mouse, right? Because it's spinning, it's going to look. It's going to look like I'm deflecting off to one side. I'm not. I'm not actually like curving around. The fo there's no force sending me that way. I'm going in a straight line, but because it's spinning, it's going to look as though I'm deflecting. Okay, so hopefully that makes sense. I will drop a video um, in uh, the module that this uh, that these are in, <clears throat> so you guys can see a better example of what that looks like. Okay, so we've got the Coriolis effect that affects the global wind systems. We've also got um, uh, these things called doldrums, which are located along the equator. There's no winds blowing there. This creates very slow rising air, very little pressure. It's why a lot of times uh, the equator is, number one, very hot, but also um, kind of very uh, dry. You do see some tropical places in the equator, but you see a lot of deserts as well. Okay, And then you've got horse latitudes. These are very weak winds that occur at the 30 north and 30 south because that's right uh, on the line where those pressure systems are um, coming together. Uh, and then you've also got um, jet streams. Now, jet streams are kind of weird to think about. These are narrow belts of high-speed winds. They blow in the upper troposphere and the lower stratosphere. They can reach speeds up to um, 400 miles or kilometers an hour. The way I want you to think about the jet streams is essentially as rivers of air that are snaking around the earth they almost never go in like a straight line it's almost it's always or almost always very like meandering and curving around like a river um and the reason for this is because the jet stream is moving along and it's got high and low pressure systems it's got air masses kind of like coming in on it and pushing it uh to either side so you get these meanders as it kind of moves through um but that's really what I want you to, ha or how I want you to think about the jet streams is as these uh, rivers of air blasting their way around the Earth um, and potentially changing up weather patterns. Because um, if a, let's say that a hurricane, you know, let's say if we rotate the Earth a little bit and we come over on this side and a hurricane is coming towards land, well, if this jet stream right here is blowing this way, then it's just going to propel that hurricane directly into the land. However, if it's going the other way and the hurricane comes up, it hits that, gets deflected, and curves back out harmlessly to sea. So the jet streams are actually pretty important um, for our for the weather that we experience. It's just that you know they're they're a little weird to think about. Okay, and we will talk about fronts in the next video. So for now, I'm going to go ahead and end it there. Um, but uh, make sure that you catch the next video so that you can finish this lecture, and I will see you all soon. Stay wonderful. Gucci.